for our supporters and people who are going to watch this interview, it'd be really nice if you can sort of tell a little bit about yourself, um, where you came from and what really drives you in tackling gender-based violence in PNG. Um, it's nice to see you again too, Ali. Um, well, thank you. And uh, my name is Lane Chubayshore and I am from Juwaka province up in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. I work with a small effective rural NGO at the provincial level. It's called Voice for Change. The primary uh, objective of this organization is peace and equality for all. We strive to ensure that our programs uh, are directly uh, working with rural women to ensure that they are inclusive participants in all levels of development and also trying to work with networking partners and key stakeholders to create safer space for our women and girls to be inclusive participants. Um, Ways for Change is a women's provincial human rights organization and it's uh, working across the seven islands region of, uh, in, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. So you touched a bit earlier on some of the work you did um, and the really diverse challenges that affect women in Papua New Guinea. So that link between um, soil improvement and gender-based violence is a link that wouldn't really come to mind, I think, for a lot of people. Um, so it's clear that you face really big and really diverse challenges um, in your work. So I was hoping you could highlight just a few of the biggest challenges that you personally face as a women's rights defender. Um, women in our society, there's different uh, marginalized and, uh, groups and vulnerable groups. Um, Gender-based violence work has never really categorized uh, access and control and um, of the resources to access these services. While working with Voice for Change, you you get to learn about things and you get to meet people. Our primary form of violence is still domestic violence in homes. Uh, family violence comes second to it. And most of this is contributed to so many social factors. And then we have emerging uh, issues of violence also. Uh, climate, climate also plays a very huge role in that. Um, women tend to bear the burden of being traditionally sole providers of domesticated household um, food, now are twice the burden to maintain that position also to provide for everyone. Uh, the greatest challenge we face here is that we do have Papua New Guinea as this very effective systems and structures and laws and policies in place. It's the service providers who are responsible for ensuring that these systems work and these policies are implemented and the laws work that are letting down the people. So the greatest challenge as a women working in the space of um, providing and supporting women of, of gender-based violence, our greatest challenge is accessing the laws of this country to protect our women and girls. Just to sort of enhance that a little bit, you said one of the biggest problems is accessing the laws um, and the structures that are in place to protect women. Um, what are the kind of specific barriers that prevent you accessing those? Is it um, the people? Is it the infrastructure? Is it is it the laws themselves that are not sort of formed correctly for you? Um, one very visible challenge is the uh, police force. They are so under-resourced and they need a huge support in their capacity building, the technical capacity in attending to women clients. They are not gender sensitized. Uh, they are also not uh, funded properly by the national government. And it also limits their reach to uh, deal with all cases that require their attention. And the couple combining that with the belief that violence against women and especially family and domestic violence is a family matter. Many cases that result in severe and grievous bodily harm in domestic cases rarely reach the prosecution's desk or rarely appears in their formal court systems. The second challenge is women are comfortable and the only access of legal services they have is the village courts, which is within the community and tribal boundaries. Um, Accessing the formal court system is costly and Papua New Guinea is still on the Human Development Index. We are still somewhat classified below poverty line and a woman will not be able to find the potential resources to tra uh, travel to the court place 
ever documents typed and filed at the courthouse. You will need a whole circle of service providers in the referral pathway to support her to receive, uh, complete the referral pathway services, which includes the health, the magisterial services, the police, the counseling, um, the support system at the community level also is not there. Uh, most of the clients and survivors of gender-based violence only complete the cycle of the referral pathway when they have the support of a immediate family member, which is most preferably a male that can really stand up to support the female in his family saying that no, a crime has been com com uh, committed against her, her rights have been violated. I want her to go through the full process and she will, he will defend her. Sometimes this support system is not effective and in place. So most women, they come halfway and then we see them settle for mediation outside the courthouse and the abuse is compensated and the perpetrator takes the person back home and the cycle just starts again. Thank you. Yeah, so it's clear there's definitely um, a, an issue with women still needing that support of men in a family to access the referral pathways and the courts um, and that kind of diminishing of the independence of women to take the process forward themselves. And I think something, um, that people in the UK probably find really interesting and don't know much about is the matrilineal clan-based societies in Papua New Guinea. Um, and I was going to ask you to sort of talk about those a little bit for the interest of supporters. And I think based on what you just said as well, it would be really interesting to hear whether um, a woman finds it a different experience accessing those referrals and those courts in a matrilineal society versus a patrilineal society, whether the support of the male relative is equally needed in both, or if in some cases women are more able to take their violence forward to be addressed. Um, yes, Papua New Guinea is a met as matrilineal societies and patriarchal societies. Um, East New Britain and West New Britain, uh, the autonomous region of Bougainville, uh, Million Bay province, they are classic examples of matrilineal society. Um, 20 years ago, yes, women will have some form of decision-making powers within their community. Fast forward 20 years now, yes, they, for instance, uh, women are landowners in this community, but having access and control over your resources is another matter. And violence is perpetrated in a space where when a man feels challenged with his access and control over a certain resource, um, I was in Bougainville three years ago with the negotiation of reopening the Panguna copper mine. Now, Bougainville is a matrilineal society and all the women landowners were invited to have this open conversation with the newly established uh, Bougainville uh, government. Um, the irony is that all the men also accompanied their wives and they were dictating Sorry, welcome to my part of the world where the internet just decides to yeah. switch on and off at will. Um, what I was saying is that like, um, to cut the story short, short it means um, I'm just saying that um, um, women have, con uh, they are the landowners, but it comes down to who has access to the resource and who controls the resources that they own. Um, and uh, for them, yes, they can make decisions, but most of the decisions are influenced by the men in the, within the circle of family that they have. In the Highlands, we, we are gendered to know that we don't own any of the land. It's a patriarchal society. You're a female, you are raised with the knowledge that you have to get married and bring in a bride price. And uh, I think uh, we are gen uh, gendered to understand that our roles and responsibilities are in a straight line. You cannot step out of line. Women have taken drastic, there have been numerous records of drastic changes in women's participation. Uh, for me, example, I am given the space to talk in, a, in my um, blessing sing or in my father's uh, public space. It comes down because I am educated 
and I am a resource to the community. I can meet the social obligations because I have the financial security to do that. And my position in there, it's not given because if I, if I didn't have that education and if I weren't this kind of person or this status, I wouldn't be given. So there is generally the battle to achieve equality comes at a price for us in our patriarchal society to be equal participants. We have to show that we are capable, we can do it. And it takes a toll on you. It takes a toll on me because this is something that we have to do to ensure that the voices of all our girls and women are being heard in that public space. And um, sometimes it, um, it makes you take back and reassess the work that you are doing, how much progress you are making. Um, is it really necessary to participate in all essence visible? Which shouldn't be the case because as a human being, I am entitled to the same privileges as the next male person. I shouldn't uh, fight for my space to be a contributing uh, partner in my community or contributing person in all levels of development. And um, it's a burden that um, educated women uh, carry constantly, uh, their expectations. So you, you were saying that, you know, education has been a great sort of empower of women, but also a burden that you that the educated women have to take on speaking for their communities and representing them. Um, financial security plays an important role and um, for educated women, we also, uh, we have certain expectations that we also have to uh, fulfill in the community, whether it be family. Most of the obligations is towards the family. And uh, it gives you a certain visibility. Um, other women might disagree, but for me personally, I, I am always grateful that I am in this situation where I can be allowed the platform to speak about issues in a public space where traditionally has been dominated by men since our ancestors started doing public speaking, I should say. So it kind of leads me on to another, I've gone a bit off script, but there's a pre-planned question, which was around your sort of top three priorities for supporting women. Um, you've mentioned sort of education, food security, income, um, and obviously you're going to have other priorities. So yeah, could you outline kind of the biggest three ways you think that women could be supported in Papua New Guinea? Um, from a gender lens perspective, um, first and foremost, for a woman to participate, she must be, she must feel safe and secured to be able to share her opinions and inputs. And uh, we don't have that in our society. Our right to contribute effectively in decision making is not visible, and. Um, we strive to ensure that communities provide this safe system. So one of the, the first way that Voice for Change approaches is gender sensitization. We engage with uh, local community leaders in our ward levels, with our village court magistrates, with our peace mediators and community leaders to uh, ensure that they do understand how women's participation leads to sustainability. And, uh, and then we try to network, link our communities with our networking partners to encourage communities to create community-driven initiatives to uh, address gender-based violence in the homes and communities. Our reach is very community and rural based because most of the population is based where we are based and we don't have a large working class population in most of the rural communities and violence is perpetrated in these homes. Twisted cultural ideologies and traditional practices are practiced in this society that we live in. So that's uh, community-driven initiatives. Uh, Voice for Change has recorded uh, vast documentaries on how community-driven initiatives have really, really impacted some families and certain communities, leading three communities to develop their own community bylaws around violence, addressing violence at the community level which basically is linking our national constitution and localizing it with our traditional laws to see which one works and which one really protects our people and which practices are not uh, 
healthy for our communities and our women and girls and our children. Uh, the second uh, focus area we work on is to ensuring that our networking partners who are providing the referral pathways for survivors of gender-based violence and especially short story accusations and related violence are functioning. Uh, we have to ensure that uh, when a woman client approaches us and she needs health care, then the referral partner there is able to provide the necessary health care that she requires, accessible and quality health care, affordable health care also. Our next uh, is working with our local police to ensure that if she lays a complaint, then the police are readily available to prioritize a complaint. We have this family sexual violence actually units here, so they deal directly with them. And then the next step is linking that case to the formal court system. From July to December alone in 2022, we have 103 cases, 153 cases that really legal cases with women that we are carrying it forward this year. And we are still waiting for our lawyer to start uh, representing them in court starting next month. Uh, so it's maintaining and strengthening this referral pathways that is a constant challenge for us while we, when we're working in this space. Uh, it also means that women have access to information in order to make uh, informed decisions about what they want to do. Uh, the final challenge we have is getting our local, provincial and district governments to really prioritize our uh, GBV strategy and action plan because it encompasses all these key areas that every partner and networking or development part, it's an holistic approach that is really encompassed in this plan. And after five years and our government is not taking notice of this plan. So advocacy and awareness for changing and lobbying for policy changes is a constant struggle for all CSOs because we really need the government to support us in the work that we are doing. The government breaks a budget every year that goes down in billions and we are totally donor driven. So we need some kind of support. So advocacy with the government is a continuous struggle for for many of our donor driven community I mean community based organizations like us. Thanks. Um you mentioned kind of strong pathways from governments um, and the importance of women feeling safe to take their issues forward. Um, I'd be interested to know if there's any kind of society or country in the world um, that you feel is making really good progress in these areas that um, either inspire you or you think are doing very well in making women safe. Um safety and security of women yes we we see all the the countries but the most country that stands out is uh, sweden um in progress made to address gender based violence in the global south we see rwanda and rwanda stands out clearly because 53% of the parliamentarian leaders is female we have a vision that by the time in the next 20 years we will have a LLG that is totally dominated by women, women in LLG presidential positions, uh, women in the open member seats. So Voice for Change, we are starting low. We are giving space to our young women in leadership program. And uh, one of the anticipated outcome that we have, we are dreaming very high is uh, three of the young women under that six year program have raised their hands to contest for our local level government elections next year and it's a it's an achievement that um, they are not women in their older years that we normally see these are young women under the age of 30 who have been mentored and nurtured and guided who have been had the capacities built over a period of six years and who will finally have reached the stage where they want to put their hands up right now we know the reality in our society we don't have a chance at the national elections but we do have a um 70 percent chance at the local ward elections so this will be the two countries that stand out right now and not forgetting some more if they can put a woman in there we can put a woman in james Marabi's position in the next five years too i think 
that's a brilliant <laughs> aim to have. Um, and I just wondered, you, you said about the three women that you're mentoring through that are going to stand at the local level government elections. Um, I think you said it's sort of taken six years of mentoring to get there. How does that compare for a man who wanted to stand in the LLG elections? Um, how quickly and how easily would he be able to do it compared to a female? Oh, it's just going to decide that if he decides in January that he's going for election next year, he's going. He doesn't need much. He just needs to open his mouth and say, I'm going for elections. You have to vote for me. And then he starts using whatever little resources he has to buy a bitter nut or a cigarette or a coffee or a Coca-Cola for anybody and everybody in the community goes, oh, he's already a leader. We're going to vote for him. But for our young women, we had to ensure that we created the environment for them to be visible, to reach a level where they are making this decision now. So you can see for us, it's taken six years. And their stories have been documented over the past six years. And uh, we are going through a strategic review of our organizational strategy next year. And we hope that that documentary will be the highlight of one of the videos that we share. That really shows um, the discrepancy between males and females, um, the six years exactly. versus six months. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'd like to sort of just touch on climate really for the last 10 minutes um, you mentioned very early on that climate um, disproportionately negatively affects women um, and I just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit um, maybe with some examples of why climate breakdown is having such an awful effect on women compared to men um, in 2014, now uh, we were we got our first funding for the United Nations Global Trust Fund to end violence against women from New York, and we conducted a baseline survey. Uh, in my ignorance, I totally assumed we had an artist draw out the different forms, 30 images of the most commonly perpetrated forms of violence in communities. In my total ignorance, I assumed that all the women would pick uh, a sign of domestic violence, but no, the women in my province they picked out uh, labor being overworked as the form of violence that they face in their homes. And it is increasing by tenfold because they are now pressured with the, all, the soil has lost its capacity to provide the natural nutrients to rehabilitate itself because it's being overworked. And now women are burdened with the responsibility of providing for their homes while providing for the markets to meet their small needs, domestic needs in the homes. Um, climate change is affecting us because we are putting a lot of pressure on our land. Most of our traditional land is being sold. The landowners are selling, commercializing our traditional land, which means that whatever little space that we have to do gardening, all the natural environment and the trees and everything, it's being destroyed to cater for ever-growing family, squeezed in one place, and it places the pressure on women to find space to produce for homes, which also leads to violence because the men will not eat kumu, greens without cooking oil in it or some form of uh, protein in it like tin fish or something and he does nothing but he expects the woman to provide and if the woman is a rural mother then she will need to toil the land to provide for the home and then whatever excess he can sell it at the local markets to get the money to meet this need and if she cannot then she is uh, violated upon again so for all programs and for the sustainability of how are livelihoods? So women are the center of it. And women are connected to climate change. Women are connected to development. Women are connected to access to clean drinking water. Women are just across all uh, levels. And in ensuring that everything is functioning, we have to maintain women's uh, participation at all levels. We have to give them this platform to participate freely. And we have to be very inclusive, understanding the factors that contribute to 
the challenges that they face at home and how to mitigate these factors to ensure that they are productive in a healthy way. Thank you. Um, so as a final question, um, Cool Earth, obviously we are a climate change charity, um, but our vision is to really back people um, in our fight against climate breakdown. So I wondered if you had one piece of advice um, that Kula should be doing to make sure that women are safe and empowered to use the land in the ways that you've talked about and make decisions about the land. What's the main thing that Kula should do for the women that we work with? I uh, I recall an interview uh, when I was interviewed by Kula. There was this. Uh, they they said that they would uh, issue mobile phones for mobile banking for communities that. Uh, Kulet was working with and uh, what would be one way to ensure that uh, this uh, approach is being uh, it's balanced in homes between in families especially spouses um, communities need to understand that uh, unless and until they acknowledge the contribution of women every project will not be sustainable which also means that allowing women a 50% church to be equal decision-making uh, partners in the homes, having uh, open conversations. And uh, in order for that to be done, advocacy and awareness is one strategy. The second strategy would be to engage all these communities to attend the basic gender and human rights training to really, most of the trainings that are designed for community approaches really look at the cultural context, the uh, religious context, and also the changing context of our uh, the progress of this country and our decisions that men make have impacted women's livelihoods and their contribution in all levels, whether it be within their families or within the communities or within any extended spaces that they are participating until and unless they are seen as equal partners, uh, programs will sustain. And men need to understand that women are nutritious and uh, they need the environment to be conducive for them to provide for their families. And environment conservation is very close to a woman because a woman takes from the land to feed the family. Thank you. 